Welcome to the Programmatic Playbook, Working Smarter, Not Harder. We're Agile. We are a full service uh, agency. We do everything from um, strategy consulting to media buying and planning and media strategy. Um, we also offer creative services, PR, a slew of other things. But today, we are joined by a couple of experts here in media and programmatic, Kelly Stoffer and Casey Stewart. I will allow them both to introduce themselves here in a moment, but we'll be walking through a couple of different things. So we'll go through decoding programmatic. What is programmatic? How do you execute a buy? Oh, there we go. Why do we leverage programmatic for lead generation and other tactics as well? Um, when should you leverage programmatic? And how do you go about measuring the success of your programmatic campaigns independently, as well as part of your overarching media mix? Oh, there we go. Moving in. All right. I am Alexa Weathers. I'm the VP of Client Development here at Agital. I balance both business development and strategy roles at Agital, supporting our clients to really identify areas of opportunity within their marketing approach to achieve overarching business goals and objectives. I've been with the company uh, for in a variety of different capacities for almost seven years, but been doing marketing for almost. Okay, I am Alexa's counterpart. I am the VP of media at Agital. Um, I am what I would say is probably a programmatic OG. I've been doing this for about 18 years. Um, really started working with programmatic vendor partners back in the day when this kind of just came to birth. So working really closely with Alexa in building out our client strategies and working hand in hand with Casey as our very special partner that we work through in order to execute programmatic. And thank you for letting me know you couldn't see the screen because that really uh, takes away from the animation magic, but, you know, troubleshooting and we've, we've moved past it. Casey, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Alexa. Awesome. I'm Casey. I am an account executive here at Stack Adapt. Um, I've been with Stack Adapt for a little over two years in the programmatic safe space, a little over three um, since I came on board at Stack Adapt, I've had the pleasure of working with Kelly um, and her team at Agital. So really excited to kind of chat through programmatic today and a little bit about what Stack Adapt can do to work with um, Agital to run some of these campaigns. So looking forward to it. Great. Well, jumping into our first section, decoding programmatic, I'm going to start a quick poll here. But if you can just let us know, what is your familiarity with programmatic advertising in general? Give it a couple minutes. All right. Thank you all for participating. We're getting a lot of really good, um, kind of a mixed bag of responses here with a majority falling into somewhat familiar. So we're excited to walk through this and give you additional knowledge to up, up your familiarity with the tactic. Kelly, take it on away. Sure. So when we talk about programmatic and based on what we're seeing in the survey, where everybody seems to be somewhat familiar um, to a point. But I think programmatic has become something of a buzz term that we like to throw around, but we don't do a great job of explaining exactly what programmatic is and how it works and benefit our client and strategy. So the way I look at programmatic is really, if you look at traditional display, is really a manual negotiation with publishers. They have inventory available. You go out and you secure it ahead of time and looking at um, how we can identify where our target group is going to be. But what can happen when you do that is it creates a little bit of a siloed effect within the journey for that customer of placing those in individual and driving those individual channels and placements towards their individual goal. And it keeps us from looking at the overall strategy and the overall goal. The big benefit of programmatic is it allows us to place multiple touch points throughout the journey and then optimize those 
based on what's performing the best in order to roll through and ensure that we are getting the best result we need out of performance. So while traditional automates that buying or programmatic automates that buying experience, and we can do that in data dr data driven decisions in real time, programmatic allows us to also access more precise targeting, greater efficiency, and campaign optimizations. Looking at this example over to the right is a great example of what we've been able to do with a very specific client um, with a very high touch message um, with Solari. So this was a mental health campaign that we were able to execute use, utilizing programmatic. And what we know is with a topic such as mental health, it's going to be so important for us to get the right message at the right time with the right mindset and messaging there. So what we were able to do is have multiple placements and working with Casey in order to target looking at one of some of those behavioral kind of aspects are in order to ensure that we kind of got that message at that right moment in order to drive the desired result of those individuals reaching out when they really needed the help at that uh, specific moment. Amazing. And really, if we can just double tap on that stack adapt partnership, um, it sounds like there was a lot of opportunity to identify efficiencies and be a little bit more strategic in how we selected those placements and worked with those different opportunities. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I can take that for sure. Um, so as we looked through with those specific placements, so understanding where the mindset was of the customer journey and really what we were trying to drive was them to reach out at that moment that they needed most or those influencers that are also within the household that can help drive them to get the help that they needed. So we had to move through from things like just general awareness of getting them to understand Solari and the services, but also utilize multiple touch points to re-engage with them as we utilize some of those behavioral indicators to understand where they were and where their need level really was. So making sure that we brought them in and understanding the services, but then kept in with those touch points to keep reminding them and really driving them towards that overall um, end result. Amazing. Yeah, I'd love to, as we kind of pop into this, really understand how like the differences and how we're working with Casey. So um, Casey, I'd love to um, hear a little bit more from you. And Kelly, I know you wanted to walk through exactly what this looks like so people can understand how this is really executed. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically what we have is we have a demand side platform where Stack Adapt lives. So this is where clients looking to purchase ad inventory across display, native, CTV, video, audio, digital out of home, in-game, whatever it may be, use it what we uh, use a demand side platform to bid on available ad placements from a variety of publishers in real time. We work with um, a variety of different data providers to gather and activate audience data as well from there um, to really drive those campaigns home. And then what we have on the other side, um, trying to get an understanding of like what's on the sell side is um, audience publishers, ad networks, um, ad servers, SSPs. And essentially what's happening is the DSP is partnering with the SSPs. So the inventory that's available, um, and then you'll have what the uh, open exchange and where the auctions take place. So that's really kind of uh, how you can kind of think about it is we're currently on the client side looking to buy the inventory and then partnering with the supply side inventory and publishers. Um, and Stack Adapt has um, publishers across uh, 40 plus different partnerships with um, SSP partners and publishers to kind of tap into a vast uh, range of inventory available. Amazing. Casey nailed it. All right. And then the difference, there there seems to be like a difference here in the types of inventory that would be available for purchase. And it just so happens that we have this whole slide set up. So can you <laughs> kind of walk through what the difference is um, in this and why it's super valuable to have a DSP partner to access the different types of inventory available? Yeah, so there are a lot of different ways that you can buy inventory through Stack Adapt. Um, we have what's called the open exchange. This is basically a public marketplace where advertisers and publishers can buy and sell the ad inventory. You'll hear a lot of times we call this run a network too. Um, same thing, it's just the open exchange market. Um, and then we also have um, private marketplace deals. So what's different about this is, is it is an invitation only marketplace. Um, so a little bit smaller of a pool that you're going to be buying from um, that gives buyers exclusive access to premium publisher inventory. 
Um, and then we have on the other side where it's programmatic direct, um, we have uh, these are what we call pre-negotiated deals. Basically, they are guaranteed and reserved volume of impressions at a fixed price. Um, essentially, it's a direct buy that gets executed through pro programmatic pipes um, and the inventory is reserved. Um, for the buyer to ensure that they can get the volume of impressions or sufficient volume um, to target that audience that they want. Um, unlike programmatic guaranteed, PMPs doesn't have that guaranteed fixed volume of impressions. So that's a little bit of the differenti differentiation there when you're thinking about it. Um, and then preferred deals, uh, we don't work with these as much, but basically what a preferred deal is, is where an advertiser has a wonder in relationship with a publisher and the advertiser gets the first look at the publisher's inventory um, before it goes to the option, uh, open auction, but there is no obligation to buy. So this is just kind of like early access into what's available and what kind of inventory you have. And then you can look at potentially setting up a programmatic guaranteed deal or a private marketplace deal. Amazing. So heading into the next section here, we, you know, now that we kind of understand the different inventory available, how a buy is really executed and how we're partnering with Stack Adapt, um, we can definitely like jump in a little bit deeper here into why do we leverage programmatic in your media mix for lead gen and a variety of other um, tactics and strategies. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit more about your perspective, Kelly, on what we've done here and why why wouldn't we want to execute this but i think the answer is we always would like to do that yeah um kind of going back to what i was saying at the beginning is there's so many different touch points within the journey um, and we know with those we need to be as efficient with our time and efficient with our clients um, dollars in order to drive the best results so Going through programmatic allows us to make those changes between channels as to what is working and what's not working and adjust in real time. Um, it's efficient for our team in order to go in and make those tweaks and changes and is more efficient in how we can drive that performance. Um, in addition, it all comes back to reporting because if we're not properly reporting, then how do we prove our ROI back to the client? So um, the transparent reporting and those mid-campaign kind of check-ins that we're able to do allow us to make sure that the AI and the machine learning is able to move as it should, and we're able to report back to the clients. For PMPs, I will let Casey kind of dive into what those specifically are and how we can leverage those to help. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a great example of the different types of PMPs we can set up across channels. Um, since we're kind of touching on digital out of home here, I'll just uh, give an example of um, how we can set up a PMP for digital out of home. Mm -hmm. So we work with um, multiple different uh, partners to provide inventory that's available for digital out of home placements. And that can be across like you think big picture, like urban panels, some of those billboards, um, or you can uh, have placements in taxi, ride share, wherever it may be. Um, so what we can do is based on your specific geo, your location, we are able to then work with our partners to find uh, the best deal that's going to uh, get you the reach you want, get you the audience and the placements across not just one specific partner, but across a variety of them to make sure that you have the billboards or have those placements where you want them to be. So I think that's really the benefit of setting up a PMP when there is like specific inventory that you're looking for. It in being able to come to us and we can reach out to multiple partners instead of having to uh, kind of silo to one specific one. Great. Okay, the good old customer journey. Um, so we really take a much deeper standpoint and, and um, kind of strategy when we look at building out our customer journey mapping. Um, this is really allows us to make sure that we use programmatic, programmatic throughout the funnel to make sure that we're connecting with audiences. So utilizing top of funnel, build awareness, broad targeting, large scale reach, mid funnel and bottom funnel. But if we don't understand the mindset and the behaviors of our specific customer, we can't align that journey and really understand the most effective way to move them through the process and down. So we really take a really close look at, and we're going to walk through it, what that customer journey mapping looks like from our standpoint at Agital. 
Yeah. And I think even looking back at that, the previous slide in terms of that placement that we executed from a digital out of home board, obviously we're talking mm -hmm. about top funnel awareness and, you know, we were trying to make sure that we're keeping that top of the funnel full. So as we continue to nurture them, they're able to move more effectively through that customer journey. Um, but definitely want to hear a little bit more about some of the tactics that are selected to ensure that we're connecting with them um, on a ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. But before we hop into that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how familiar people are with customer journey mapping, if you're using it in your current media strategy to identify the right tactics to make those connections with those audiences? Are you understanding their behaviors, where they're consuming their media? Um, and really at the end of the day, really just like leveraging your personas in a really effective way rather than developing them and then leaving them on the shelf. Give it a couple more seconds here. All right, we have a good mix here. Um, some people are, about half are are not, and some just want to kind of learn more. I think um, that's a, a great trend that we're kind of identifying is that we have a varying levels here of familiarity, um, but we're ready and poised to kind of fill that, that gap in knowledge. Great. So jumping back to a point that you just made, Alexa, about um, the funnel and how all of those need to work together um, it's really, really important when we're looking, especially how to leverage programmatic within our journey. We have to think about how that journey has changed. We know back in the day, we used to follow that very linear journey of awareness, consideration, conversion. Well, we also know user and consumer behavior has really changed, especially coming out of COVID. But in a lot of ways, it's really, really changed just with what's in the market. So here's kind of how we look at it and what we're seeing with uh, users in the journey in this current state. So what we see is those trigger points that happen where we drop those users in and they really start to bounce back and forth between interest, consideration and research, and then down into conversion. But that bounce back and forth between interest, consideration and research can happen for a really extended period of time. We also see that they kind of at times stop within this part of their journey and hold. So this is where it's really, really important that we keep those awareness tactics along this kind of outer edge. This becomes what we call our client's ecosystem. So if we keeping them within the ecosystem, awareness tactics is kind of that moat that keeps them in. With awareness, it keeps them top of mind and mind share so that when each individual trigger point happens, that that first client brand is the first thing to come to mind and drops them immediately back into interest, consideration, research, and back all the way through. So when we are looking at building out that whole journey, we have to keep all of these in mind. In addition, that trigger point is something that we're seeing happen far more times than what we had historically kind of been shown. We know we all, you know, went to marketing school and they all told us that it was seven touch points to change a behavior. Well, now we're seeing that it's about 32 touch points for a Snickers bar. So when we're talking about these lead gen specific campaigns that have a higher price tag that we're going after with those client targets, we know we are going to need to be very strategic, very methodical and how we are keeping them within that ecosystem so that we can ensure every time they hit that trigger point that that our client's brand is the first one that comes to mind to drop them within. Yeah, and I think this journey or this this funnel um, approach really lends well to both lead generation and e-commerce type campaigns mm -hmm. where you know naturally we're trying to make sure that we're warming up leads um, and continuing to track the ways that they're engaging with content throughout their journey. So if they've, to say we're using a white paper or a webinar as we are today, um, we are able to then make sure that we're warming them up, their lead score is improving, we're understanding the content that they're engaging with from an e-commerce perspective, we're trying to build them into being a loyal customer and a repeat purchaser, what is their purchase history so that we can continue to retarget them and bring them back to purchase additional products from you. 
Um, so really, we just want to make sure that this ecosystem is living and breathing and we're thinking about different ways that the the tactics that we're leveraging, particularly and obviously in the programmatic sense, is keeping all of that top of mind, but also supporting throughout um, that customer journey. Uh, and I will allow that to kind of like segue into some Great. of the ways that we're doing that. Yeah. So here's a great example of kind of then in a storyline, if you will, how that plays out from programmatic and how we leverage multiple different touch points through programmatic in order to kind of drive throughout that ecosystem. So in a great example of this, if we're talking about probably a home builder client that we are working with, we would then utilize something like CTV and programmatic audio to really drive that awareness and keep those touch points as we go through in order to keep them within that um, kind of ecosystem and that mind share is high. Um, then prospecting display can be used. Prospecting display allows us to kind of reach those that have a high index for who our target is, but have not yet interacted with our brand. So utilizing that to get in front of the right eyeballs, leveraging online video. We know in some cases, um, especially for males, online video is one of the top channel media consumption tools that they utilize. So making sure that we are able to highlight the benefits of a specific home builder community with that longer storytelling um, type platform of online video to really highlight those benefits for them and allow them to see themselves maybe in that community. Then making sure we're utilizing high impact display as they're going through in that kind of interest or wanting to get more information, making sure we stay top of mind. As they go deeper into really starting to research, leveraging native display that we know when they are looking at related content, that we are right there anytime they're looking at information regarding mortgage rates or any of those things with the specific area that they're looking at, making sure that we are part of that conversation. Then we know we've got them in native and we can utilize display retargeting, making sure that at every touch point we've got, we remind them. They then can go into search and in social, which is what we're seeing social being used as a search engine a lot more um, in the current journey. So making sure that we leverage there to drop them into email and the kind of golden egg at the end is into advocacy. So helping them leverage their social post to show what a great experience it has been in working with our home builder client and maybe influencing those around them. Um, to also purchase. Yeah. And the great thing too, as they've, you know, converted, obviously now we have their information, they may be cookied. So we're able to you leverage additional targeting tactics because we have a better idea of who they are. And we're also yeah. tracking them within the CRM. So that email marketing piece really becomes critical in terms of building into that loyalty and advocacy piece. So I um, definitely love to see how this mix and how programmatic really fits within the, the about that customer journey. Casey, I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the, the unique ways that you can leverage some targeting in the DSP. Sounds good. My favorite thing to talk about is targeting. We can go on and on. Um, with programmatic, we obviously leverage audience segments to find hyper-relevant users for our campaigns. And there are a lot of different ways that we can find the right audience, including like targeting people using mobile devices, targeting users reading about a particular topic on the web through our browsing audiences or viewing a competitor website. Um, it's also possible to upload first-party data into the platform in real time for campaigns when you want to leverage any first-party audiences to either include, exclude, or like run the look-like audience. Um, or we can access um, our third party audiences through uh, multiple data providers that we have available. Um, another really great one is Cookieless. We've been hearing about this a lot. And eventually one day the cookie will be phased out. Who's to say when at this point, I think is up in the air. But uh, we also have contextual uh, targeting solutions that are available. So rather than targeting ads based on user behavior, where contextual advertising uh, fits in is we uh, it's based on the environment in which the ad appears. So this targeting me method uses the algorithm to target ad placements based on things like keywords and website content. Um, this way ads are shown to users based on the content they are consuming at that moment in time. Really great tool that we have available as well. 
Um, I know we talk a little bit about lead gen um, and one that's really good for B2B marketers and that's um, account-based marketing. So being able to target users by company domain lists or firmographic data. Um, for example, we can target decision makers who work at specified companies or if you don't have a company list available, and we can just leverage um, strictly firmographic data to reach, say, like business uh, decision makers in tech or in real estate or in healthcare, whatever it may be, um, to make sure you're reaching the right audiences. So a lot of different um, targeting capabilities and resources for you guys to make sure that you're reaching the right audiences um, and running your efficient marketing um, campaigns. Yeah, these are a lot of really great tactics. I know we regularly joke about, especially Kelly, about how how creepy we can get with some of our targeting. Um, but really, I mean, creepy just means really effective. And we're just trying to build connections, build relationships so that we can help the clients that we're working with achieve their goals and objectives. So I definitely love to hear a little bit more about how we approach media strategy to achieve these defined goals. So let's... uh kind of head into what that, what that really looks like from a customer behavior perspective. How are we building those, those connections based on some of the, the research we've done on the target audiences? Yeah, I think one note on that too, and, and Casey really touched on it quickly, is where cookies and cookie-less future goes, we, we don't really know, but we also have to find that perfect kind of middle ground of personalization and privacy and understanding kind of what level of personalization the customer is comfortable with in order to not kind of step on their toes from a privacy perspective. And in order to really start to understand that, we have to really start to understand our kind of customer and their journey and really what is their mindset. So what we do in order to build that out is what I call our personas on steroids. What you see a lot in um, some of this brand and persona build work is that they get built out from a branding perspective. And then as Alexa said at the top of the call, they kind of get left on the shelf and don't really get leverage for the full strategy throughout. So we actually build out um, kind of bigger personas in order to help us determine those specific touch points and those specific timing that we wanna look at within the journey. So instead of just looking at motivators and behaviors and beliefs as to just understand from a branding perspective, we layer in kind of their media consumption habits, but we look at behaviors and beliefs in order to refine what those specific um, channel kind of targets that we've got. So one great example of this that we um, leveraged previously with a client was trying to motivate Gen Z to um, donate was where we were. And Gen Z in beliefs and behaviors and motivators is they wanted public and quick kind of public view of what they had achieved and done. So in working with them, we worked on doing a hashtag campaign where they could have that immediate gratitude and um, reflection on what they had been able to achieve within donations. So that's a great example of, yep, we know that they are maybe within this specific um, programmatic audio, we can reach them there, but we also look at their behaviors and beliefs and how we can tweak that in order to leverage that channel to be just even more effective. Yeah, the and other, I, I love that, oh. that campaign because as they, as you mentioned with the hashtag, they were able to then display that photo by the use of that hashtag on yep. digital out of home billboards. So they got that like immediate recognition um, yep. of, of their donation and were able to kind of see themselves in in the lights there, like like they're a superstar. Yep, exactly, <laughs> exactly. The other thing that we do when we take a look at the customer journey is. You traditionally see it very segmented of looking at the marketing customer journey. And then once they've kind of landed on the site, it's almost like it's a hands-off. And then the UX team is really working on what they can do in order to get that desired response um, down at the bottom. We really work to bring all of that together so that we make sure that that from that very first 
marketing touch point all the way to the end to that final conversion or even once we've got them through in order to be an ambassador for our brand, making sure that they're all tied together and making sure that all of those channels and tactics that we've selected and that messaging at that right time really got us through to that desired result once they landed on page. Yeah. And I think as you can kind of see on the, the slide here, we're obviously looking through on, I mean, it's very small because it's a sample, but mm -hmm. as you can see on Cali, the connector and the, the green and the, with the yellow sort of post-it note sort of feel, that's really the, the different engagements that we expect this um, persona to make throughout that customer journey. So for feeding them a white paper, or they've perhaps converted on a specific product, what is the next thing that we want to serve them up so that they're continuing to engage and we're, we're, we're providing them with content and material that makes them stay within that funnel that Kelly showed that was that really great little diamond graphic. And we do this across a variety of different personas so that we're able to say like, yes, Callie, the career connector as an example is exhibiting XYZ behavior and has different media consumptions. But if we get into one of our other personas, they're, they're going to vastly differ. So we need to make sure that we're identifying the unique tactics and content and creative that is then building connections across all of those personas. Great. So when do we need to be leveraging programmatic? All the time. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> um, so programmatic, as we talked about, can be used in every step of the way. So in top of funnel, we use uh, programmatic to build awareness using those broad targeting and that large scale reach. In mid funnel, we use more precise targeting and we can look at the behavior and engagement to nurture that interest. And then in bottom of the funnel, we use that retargeting and those highly specific audience segments that really allow us to drive conversions and repeat business. So once we've got that dedicated budget, we understand those very specific campaign goals and have adjusted for who our target audience is, what those behavioral personas have told us in order to make sure we're at the right moment, right time, right message. And that message really comes in with the creative team to help design those assets. That is another big point in the differentiator and how we look at this is it's not a siloed of media, brand, and then creative kind of thought of a latter part of the planning process. Creative is part of the planning throughout. And then also ensuring that we've established kind of that testing methodology at the start of our campaigns to ensure that we know what we're going to test from a messaging and a placement perspective to just ensure ongoing optimization. Great. Yeah, I'd love to, you know, I know we have a specific way that we go about media strategy. So can we, can you give us a little bit more information in terms of how we're laddering up those objectives and tactics to those business goals? Yep. Sometimes we can get kind of siloed in our own view of what is the specific campaign's goal and objective, but it's very vital that we keep everything as to what is our overall client's business vision strategy and what those objectives and goals are. So we build everything out of what our client's business vision strategy is. So we make sure that every then business goal ladders back up to that overall strategy, and then every objective, marketing objective, campaign objective that we establish ladders up to that business goal, and the specific tactics are then selected in order to make sure that we're driving those objectives, those goals to their overall strategy. So if you keep that as your North Star, then when we go back and look at the return on the investment on what we've done from a performance standpoint, we can always ladder back and give our clients that return on investment to their overall mission and moving through. Yeah. And when you're thinking about this, obviously we're thinking about the broader media mix, but when we're selecting programmatic um, tactics, different targeting opportunities, where are you sort of thinking that programmatic plays a, a role in identifying those tactics based on the objectives? Yeah, we can utilize that data to really identify the right audience segments and channels that most effectively drive those conversions and reach those goals. And then based on what we were talking about, you know, that journey can change, that that user kind of behavior can change. So 
programmatic allows us to quickly adapt with them um, mm -hmm. and continually optimize the strategy based. Okay, amazing. Great. And Casey, I know like as we're kind of talking about the the broader media mix, we're we're looking at a couple of different uh internets or gardens, as you will. Can you kind of walk us through what this kind of means for uh marketing in general? Yeah, absolutely. Uh so we definitely want to be a part of uh your data driven marketing efforts and kind of complement your um efforts that you are running within the wall garden. So just to give you an idea of what wall gardens are, they're, it's what kind of another one of those terms that we use in this space, but these are essentially um, media companies that uh, require digital advertisers to run campaigns within their proprietary platforms. So for example, to advertise on Facebook, you typically have to buy directly through Facebook. Uh, the same applies to platforms like Google and Amazon. Um, and what's uh, what this can create is a little bit of a complex and limiting um, strategy. So when you think about full funnel um, and tapping into all different uh, channels and um, inventory available, uh, the most effective way is to run an omni-channel campaign in Stack Adapt or in uh, Programmatic um, that complements your efforts within those wall gardens as well. Yeah, I, I obviously love uh, to make a good pun here. So there's a, a lot of different gardens that we're playing in across the digital landscape, but would definitely love to hear both of your perspective on where, what is the future of this landscape and how is programmatic adapting to these different walled garden environments? Yeah, I can take a stab first and then let Casey go. I think something that I touched on um, a moment ago is we're definitely going to be moving towards a somewhat privacy focused targeting strategy, but where do we get, how do we utilize first party data and clean rooms to stay compliant in privacy, but how do we also have that personalization level of what everybody has come really accustomed to expecting from um, their journey and experience. So that's something that's really interesting. AI and machine learning is going to continue to drive just more of those personalized experiences um, and allow us to have a little bit more of that balance. But we know AI is like a big thing and that's what we're really able to leverage um, in order to go there. And as we've seen the market and that ecosystem, part of where that is, is just there's a saturation in the market. And that is really what is increasing the number of touch points that are necessary to really change that behavior. So that just means that programmatic is even more important with the ability to have that kind of cross channel integration and our ability to shift and move based on what that customer journey is and making sure that we're able to kind of see them throughout the journey and not just segmented in one um, place at one time. Yeah, and I can um, piggyback off of that. Uh, that's kind of where I think the programmatic landscape is headed as well, is really driving personalization um, and making those touch points valuable. We've already seen this um, through the adoption of dynamic creative optimization. So historically, advertisers have used DCO mainly as like a direct response tool, um, like retargeting retail audiences with products they've previously viewed or added to their cart. But really where I see this going in the next few years and where I think it will continue to progress is marketers leveraging DCO to, to deliver personalized messaging across the entire marketing funnel. So not just as a lower funnel tactic, it's going to be used across dynamic video, um, which has been an emerging trend over the past few years. We've seen already interactive video um, in CTV uh, placements, looking to get more personalized and cause, um, more engaged experiences across those touch points. Um, and that's going to be huge for as we continue to progress in this space, just making sure that uh, your ads stand out above the noise. And we will do that um, through different uh, touch points, obviously, um, and with personalized experience across the full funnel. Great. Yeah. Always love a full funnel approach, but um, want to understand, like, how are we going about measuring success? I've talked a lot about business goals and objectives, but would like to kind of hear um, what does this kind of look like in practice? And how are you, uh, Casey, kind of demonstrating the value that programmatic campaigns are then providing clients throughout that mix? Yeah, absolutely. 
So we offer a variety of different reporting insights um, to help guide our analysis and better understand campaign performance. Um, we have an easy to use and fully customized reporting dashboard for any of your online reports available right within the platform. But then we can also provide deeper analysis through additional measurement solution, solutions such as brand lifts um, to understand the incremental impact of your marketing efforts beyond just clicks, completion rates, and impressions. Um, these insights can help us understand things like consumer perception, awareness and consideration, whatever it may be. Uh, some of the other ones that we have available that a lot of our uh, clients lean on is measurement solution like foot traffic attribution to help understand the impact of how your advertising campaigns are driving in-store traffic. Um, for ABM campaigns, for any uh, account-based marketing efforts, we offer uh, insights into engagement level data by account, firmographic, and persona level attributes. Um, we also can lean on our data science team to help conduct a detailed analysis of your campaign's performance and identify what worked, what didn't, and then suggest adjustments to improve future results. So we offer a lot of different measurement solutions that are available just uh, that go way beyond uh, just uh, performance metrics um, mm -hmm. to help you guide uh, your campaign strategy uh, for future ongoing um, and really just get an understanding of uh, consumer perception. Yeah. And Kelly, I think, you know, understanding the metrics that Stack Adopt is typically providing to us, how are we then kind of folding that into the to the larger story? Yeah. So going back to kind of the the family tree that we talked about of their overall business goals and objectives, what we do when we start to look at reporting with our clients is first understanding what those goals and objectives and everything that um, they're driving their business towards then understanding the stakeholders who are going to be looking at this reporting and needing to leverage it. I usually like to ask them, like, what are the top five questions that you need the report to answer really quick right off the bat so that they're armed and we make them look good with having that data on how everything is performing. So if we establish the clear KPIs, aligning all those metrics and everything to those business goals, it allows our reporting then to go beyond just clicks and impressions, but really allows us to focus on key outcomes like how have we impacted revenue growth, lead generation, how have our conversion rates shifted, and then really, really diving in based on everything that Casey's team is able to give us allows us to provide insights that really help the clients make those data-driven decisions for future campaigns future business objectives, how all of that letters back to them. So really allowing them to tell the story internally and then use the data in order to make future decisions makes it very, very, a very strong partnership that we have with our clients with that. Yeah, that, that ongoing communication is definitely critical to campaign success in general and getting that, that feedback loop in terms of how, what, are, what are the conversions that you're seeing? Are you seeing quality leads coming in based on the um, ways that the things that we're able to see? Um, but that feedback loop is super critical to informing, you know, our, our ongoing approach. Yeah. And really being able to give them the detailed breakdown of not just campaign performance, but looking at it as like the audience behavior and mm -hmm. what that engagement has been that's so much more valuable for the client to be able to take away and make those kind of business decisions based off of that, rather than us just giving them a bunch of numbers for numbers sake and just right. putting it in front of them. Yeah. Nobody wants to look at a bunch of numbers all the time, unless, you know, well, unless you unless do media. I yeah. Unless you do, unless you're a media, <laughs> like, I just want to talk about strategy and then leave the numbers to you. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. So uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're we're kind of trying to make sure that people kind of understand the value in a partnership. Like, why should you partner with Agital? Um, and why why do we really work with with Stack Adapt? And I think from from my perspective, and I would love to hear yours as well, is really we're after only partnering with the best of the industry here. So making sure that we have access to the best inventory for our clients. And that we're able to build those partnerships to get the best recommendations. But um, at the end of the day, like, why should you partner with us? And what kind of results are we getting based on the approach that we've described throughout? Yeah, love to walk through this example. Um, so this aligns um, with that story that we kind of 
talked through earlier, but really um, one partnership that we had with Casey and her team that really shows what the benefit is, is we um, had a home buyer client that we really wanted a solution that drove better quality conver conversions and really able to leverage that hyper-relevant brand messaging based off of what that user's browsing history and location-based data is. If you think about the way that a consumer is going to look for a new home, is you have to think in their mindset that they're going to start with the general area and what is available in that area. Then they're going to get down to the specific community that they're looking at. And that was going to be impacted by what amenities are in that community or what is the price point of the homes within that community. And then they're going to go deeper down into looking at the specific inventory. So if we can look at hyper relevant brand messaging that aligns to kind of that mindset and that journey, looking at their browsing history and specifically looking at that location based data. So the strategy that we really built out working with Casey's team is that full funnel strategy, hyper targeting those specific geos and really getting into promote our client specific communities that they had built inventory in. Obviously the goal was to generate those leads and in order to do that, we were driving towards form fills on site where they would essentially send through their information to get a call back from an internet home consultant. Um, we needed to make sure that we were reaching those relevant users who were really interested in buying, um, those ones who really had high intent. So therefore, we launched the campaign focused on that dynamic retargeting so that we could make sure that the message and the timing was perfect. And in order to kind of know where their mindset was, we could use page context AI in order to really prospect those tactics or using prospect tactics in order to gather and uh, make sure we got that pool of retargeting audiences in order to drive further down. We were able to utilize, as I said, dynamic retargeting, geographic targeting, and page context AI. And with that, in the end, we were able to produce um, great results by decreasing the CPA by 33%. We increased the click-through rate by 40%. And the CTV uh, view completion rate was 98%. So really, really great, strong engagement, um, driving really, really high quality traffic for our client. Yeah. And I think, you know, obviously you're talking about this from the lens of real estate, but the way that we approached this strategy is super applicable to many yeah. industries. Um, so um, definitely knowing that we're kind of sprinkling in the right programmatic tactics throughout that customer journey to achieve these super effective results. And then being able to kind of tell that story back to the client that the, the ways in which we're selecting these tactics and uh, engaging your audience is then leading to this lift, this efficiency in their marketing spend. Um, obviously, we're seeing super, super strong results across the board here. Yep. Yep, exactly making sure that we're hitting them when they're looking at, like I talked about, those looking at content such as mortgage rates or first-time home buyers, then being able to tailor that messaging is really what's very important in a very highly competitive market such as yeah, real estate. Exactly. And one thing I will add is something that we work with Agital a lot on is uh, new opportunities come our way and we want to make sure that we have the uh, solutions available, the right targeting tactics, whatever it may be. Um, this has been something that uh, it's been a huge lift for us over the years is continuing to make sure our solutions um, are meeting Agital's needs and be being able to provide for their clients. So we constantly are uh, bringing in new offerings and new solutions into the space uh, to improve our campaigns um, and ongoing success. Amazing. And then with, you know, into 2025 planning, do you have any recommendations for how best to evaluate their media mix or overarching strategy um, based on some of the successes that that we've seen and how we're heading into planning with some of our clients right now? Yeah, I'd say, you know, above all, focus on the data-driven insights. What is the data telling you? Where is it telling you to go? What channels are working? And where are there some inefficiencies that you can move through? Um, most importantly, make sure that that strategy is flexible. 
Um, it needs to be something that can adapt to the changing market conditions and those changing consumer behaviors um, and make sure you can utilize a partner like Stack Adapt to optimize across channels and adjust those spending based in the real-time performance data so you're not doing it kind of after the fact. You can really do it as it's happening to ensure that you um, drive that performance all the way throughout. Amazing. Yeah. And I had pretty much a similar response. I think focus on what's working while still uh, being open to test new channels and opportunities. Your strategy only improves by learning from both the successes and failures. So being able to experiment with new channels, audiences, or campaign strategies, um, the digital landscape is constantly evolving and we have to continue to expand and adapt to your strategy uh, to make sure that your campaigns are performing and maximize performance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both for this great discussion. I'm going to launch our, our final poll here, um, but would love to know based on the, you know, some of the recommendations, would you like to, you know, connect with us or want to hear or see our strategy roadmap and plan so that we can help you with your 2025 planning and at least, or give you a tool that can help you do that. And we're also super happy to provide more information. We love talking about this as you can hopefully see in our discussion here. Um, but yeah, definitely appreciate all the participation as well. Um, but I'll give it just a couple more more seconds here, but would love to love to engage with all of you. All right. I think in the last five minutes here, we can then open it up for any Q&A. We had a question here on why would buyers purchase inventory on a private market versus open exchange or a preferred deal? And I think some of that was um, addressed earlier in the, in the um, presentation here, but would love to hear a little bit more from either of you in terms of, you know, why, why should we do that? That's a great question. Casey, do you want to go take a stab yep. first and I can give mine? Go ahead. Yep. Yeah, it's a great question. So it really comes down to uh, the goals and what they're looking to uh, gain from the specific types of inventory. So with programmatic guaranteed, uh, if you're wanting a specific amount of impression volume or a uh, specific inventory that um, is more premium and you want to make sure you have enough impressions on that, um, then we would explore a direct buy route of through programmatic where we would, it would come at a fixed rate um, and you would have uh, the agreed upon impressions available. Um, and then for any type of uh, private marketplace deal where it's more premium placements, you have a little bit more control over uh, that that kind of that deal setup and where your ads are gonna be placed. So that would be, if you want access to the inventory uh, that's a bit more premium or uh, something like that, then we would explore a PMP deal um, cause that would give you a little bit more control, but you wouldn't have that factor of like needing a, a fixed rate or, um, a s significant number of impressions or a agreed upon impressions. Um, and then the open exchange is where, you know, it's going to be efficient across a variety of different, um, inventory partners. So you would have, um, potentially more reach across a vast range of inventory. So it really just comes down to, uh, your campaign goals and something that we always can strategize with too on which route would make the most sense for your campaign objectives. Yeah. Great. Job. Uh, we got uh, just another question here in terms of how, if we're thinking about the way that the media mix has been approached traditionally, how do we go about um, showing the value of a programmatic campaign as part of the overarching media mix when we've been so ingrained in these other like more traditional tactics like social and search? Yeah, I think there's there's two things to, uh, two answers to that question. First is we have to remind the client and, and it, it comes often where a client will say, well, based on just looking at performance numbers, it looks like search is the only thing that's actually performing. Well, we have to then show the client how search is a demand pull tactic, not a demand push tactic. And so if I don't have enough invent or if I don't have enough demand in the market to pull for search, then I'm not going to have anything that I that I can go after. So I have to, I have to, have to 
have those awareness and initial interest um, tactics that help kind of feed that funnel to then have those individuals to search and for me to then target through search. So that's very specific to them. The other um, way that we really have found success in highlighting with clients to understand the value of programmatic in addition to social and search is actually that customer journey mapping and laying that out. And then when we have done that and then essentially grade out for the client all of the touch points that they're currently missing with just running social and search, it really helps for them to see from that standpoint, there's so many gaps and you're asking so much out of social social and search to really carry that heavy load and where you're going to have people drop off in their journey if you don't hit them within each touch point. So really literally putting it in front of them and showing them where what roadblocks and what pieces they're missing. Yeah. And I think in the, the final minute, I would just add the other side of that is, you know, if we're thinking about only last click attribution, that there's, it's like a huge gap, right? So we need to think about uh, adopting multi-touch attribution models or even like position-based attribution models so that you can kind of understand um, how people are converting or engaging with you throughout that customer journey. Um, and we, you know, definitely make sure that we have the right events set up to track those those types of activities through um, customers' engagement. So um, definitely want to want to wrap up here. Um, but we welcome any and all questions. Please reach out to um, us directly. My um, we'll we'll send over emails. We'll have a couple people reaching out. But would love to hear from any of you. Please feel free to email alexa.weathers at agital.com um, with any of your additional questions. But we appreciate your time and hope that you found this session informative. So thank you so much.